Welcome to FASB's webcast for investors on the soon-to-be-effective leasing standard. The standard is effective beginning January 1, 2019 for public companies and a year later for all other companies. I'm Shandy Smith, Investor Liaison at the FASB, and joining me today is Board Member Hal Schroeder. Hal, adoption of the standard by public companies is right around the corner. What are the big changes to financial reporting that investors can expect? Shandy, I'll, I'll cut to the chase. The biggest change, leases of property and equipment that were reported as rent expense on the income statement and appeared nowhere on the balance sheet, will now be on the balance sheet as lease-related assets and liabilities. These are called operating leases, but what that means is that companies must identify all their leases, compute the present value of their lease payments, and determine the amounts to be recorded on the balance sheet. On the income statement, companies will continue to record rent expense for operating leases. Leases shorter than one year qualify for an exemption. They can be expensed and not recognized on the balance sheet, but these amounts must be disclosed. On the cash flow statement, payments for operating leases show up in operating activities. Okay, so what about the accounting treatment for leases that are already recorded on the balance sheet today, so-called capital leases? Uh, apart from the name, they're now called financing leases. Not much has changed. These leases are recorded on the balance sheet. Amortization and interest expenses related to these assets is reflected on the income statement. And in the cash flow statement, payments for principal are separately recorded in financing activities. So have the tests to determine what is considered an operating lease and what is considered a financing lease changed at all? The tests were made more principal-based, but still focused on determining when the transfer of ownership and risk have moved to the lessee. If ownership and risk have transferred, it, it's a financing lease. If not, it's an operating lease. Okay, so let's step back for a second. Why did the board take on this project? When the board was conducting research for this standard, we learned that many financial statement users were already making adjustments. They did this to better capture an estimated one and a quarter trillion dollars in off-balance sheet assets and liabilities resulting from leasing obligations. Often they roughly estimated by, say, multiplying a, a seven or some other multiple to rent expense to calculate an amount for operating assets and liabilities. Those calculated amounts were then used in determining metrics such as return on assets, return on capital employed, or, or leverage. Like investors, the board too believed they represented true assets and obligations that should be reflected on financial statements. They also believed users needed better information about leases, including their terms and amounts. So I'm guessing a good way to get a sense of the impact to reported assets and liabilities is perhaps to use the currently provided long-term obligations table where companies were previously disclosing future lease payments. Would you say that's a good starting point? Uh, yeah, Com companies should be providing disclosures about the estimated impact of the new standard in advance of the uh, first quarter 2019 reporting. But if you want to make uh, your own estimate, I'd start with the long-term obligations table. However, companies will likely be reevaluating many arrangements to see if they contain a lease. For example, there could be arrangements that are considered service contracts that actually contain a lease, but the lease components were previously not identified and recorded. This could result in different amounts being reported than what's currently in disclosures. Okay, good to know. So let's get into the nitty gritty of how leased assets and obligations are measured. What's the discount rate used to discount the present value of future minimum lease payments? A lessee should, if possible, use the interest rate implicit in the lease. If not, they should use their incremental borrowing rate, which is the rate of interest a lessee would have to pay to borrow on a collateralized basis over terms similar to those in the lease contract. A lessor would use the, the rate implicit in the lease itself. How about variable payments? So, for example, when a portion of the lease cost is determined by percentage of sales? Variable payments will be expensed when incurred and not included in the measurement of the right of use asset and lease out liability. Also, variable payments must be disclosed. You mentioned before that short-term leases can be expensed. Can you talk about that more? Yeah, uh, for cost benefit and practical reasons, the board provided an option to expense leases with terms of less than one year and not to recognize them on the balance sheet. However, these amounts must be disclosed as well as the fact that the accounting policy was elected. 
Okay, so you mentioned terms. How are renewals considered in determining rental terms? So, for example, a company may have rented the same headquarters office space for many, many years, and it doesn't plan on relocating, but the lease is structured as a series of five-year renewals. Should five years be used, 25 years, or some other term? There's obviously some judgment involved in determining the lease terms. Uh, the guidance says if renewal is reasonably certain, the renewal should be factored into the initial measurement of the lease. But this is an area where I think there could be more comparability issues in how it's applied. So there are disclosures such as weighted average lease terms that are meant to help a user understand and possibly adjust for differences between companies in the measurement of these obligations. The board ultimately believe that the lease obligation should represent the contractual obligation of a company and that it's important to distinguish between a company that had the flexibility to renegotiate or even discontinue its lease every five years versus one that had locked it in for, for the next 25 years. The board believed these two situations were economically different. All right, so let's talk briefly about lessor accounting. What are the major changes under the new standard? Well, the quick answer is we don't expect there to be very many changes. The board did change some of the guidance to be consistent with revenue recognition guidance, which may affect when and how amounts are recognized by lessors. Also, there could be additional leases identified as part of existing service contracts. For example, if equipment is being provided as part of a service contract, it's possible the equipment may need to be carved out and separately accounted for. But there are no major changes to the types of leases that lessors will account for, and these are operating, that's when they're really just renting out the asset. Direct financing, think of it as they retain the right to control the residual asset, but the lessee controls the asset while they're using it. There's sales type uh, leases. This is when ownership and control is considered to be transferred to the lessee. These categories are similar to the existing categorization of leases today. Can you remind us just at a very high level of the differences in accounting for each of these types of leases? Sure. At one end of the spectrum, operating leases, that's the asset is kept on the books of the lessor and the profits are recorded over time. Any initial direct cost to get the lease up and running are capitalized and expensed over time. At the other end of the spectrum, sales type leases, assets are removed from the books and selling profits are immediately recognized as though the asset had been sold. Initial direct costs are immediately expensed in the case of a manufacturer or the asset being sold. Any retained interest in the lease is recorded as net investment in the lease receivable. Direct financing leases are similar to sales type leases. The difference being that selling profit are booked over time. Of course, losses are booked immediately. And initial direct costs are capitalized as part of the net investment in the lease and expensed over time. OK, thanks, Hal. So the ISB decided to take a different approach. Under IFRS, lessees will record the assets and liabilities for all leases on balance sheets. This part is similar to US GAAP. However, a major difference is that all leases under IFRS will reflect amortization and interest on the income statement. This will cause differences between US GAAP and IFRS in widely used metrics such as EBITDA, and it will result in a different pattern of reported income over time, as more interest is reported in earlier periods under IFRS, whereas US GAAP will reflect straight line expense for operating leases. Can you explain the board's rationale for this, Hal? Sure. The IASB disagreed with the FASB's conclusion that some leases are just rentals of equipment and thus should re be reflected as rent expense. For lessor accounting, the ISB has two types of leases, operating and financing. Operating leases will be treated similar to operating leases under US GAAP. Financing leases are treated, for the most part, like sales type leases under US GAAP. With the asset being removed from the books and any residual amounts being recorded as net investment in the lease. Revenue and cost of sale are booked at lease commencement. Under IFRS, when a lessor did not manufacture the equipment it is leasing, but it is transferring most of the benefits and control, the lease is treated in a manner similar to a direct financing lease under US GAAP, with recognition of profit and initial direct cost over time.
Now, sometimes non-lease components and lease components are both included in a single contract. For example, if you combine, let's say, equipment with service. What are the rules about treatment of those non-lease components? Okay. Lessors and lessees must determine whether a contract contains a non-lease component, for example, a maintenance services, along with a lease component. This is similar to identifying different performance obligations in revenue recognition. If multiple components exist, they must be accounted for separately. Total consideration of the contract is allocated between the lease and non-lease components. Property taxes and insurance are not separate components, so are allocated to the lease and non-lease components if necessary. However, there are exceptions with both lessees and lessors. They can elect not to separately account for lease and non-lease components. For lessors, there are criteria that must be met to make this election. Are there any tax implications of the new standard? To the extent profits are being deferred on the books relative to to tax purposes, which would be the case for some direct financing leases, deferred tax assets will increase. You mentioned earlier some additional disclosures. What are the most significant ones? Personally, I think the weighted average lease terms remaining, along with the weighted average discount rate used to measure leases, will help users understand differences in how leases are being measured. Also, separate disclosure of short-term and variable lease costs will provide a better understanding of a company's lease obligations and how both short-term and variable lease payments relate to the total lease cost. I'm sure you've already heard some information from companies that are implementing the standard as we get closer to the effective date. Are companies having a difficult time implementing the standard? And if so, what are the types of questions that the FASB is getting? When the board was finalizing the lease standard, it was told by preparers that retaining a two classification system and separate accounting for operating leases and finance leases for lessees would be advantageous. That was because significant changes wouldn't be required and the cost to implement would be minimal. As the implementation date moved closer, preparers cited significant needs for new systems and expressed that they were incurring greater costs to implement the standard than anticipated. The FASB mitigated some of their concerns by providing another transition method whereby the standard can be adopted as of the effective date. That is January 1st, 2019 for calendar year-end public business entities without reflecting the new guidance in comparable periods. Under this transition method, the disclosures under the current guidance will still be provided. As always, the FASB stands ready to answer all implementation questions and has been dealing collaboratively with it, stakeholders, including preparers and large accounting firms. Many of the questions the staff have recently received, which required standard setting, are specific to lessor accounting. Although we didn't intend to change lessor accounting, questions have been raised because leasing is a revenue generating activity. So in most instances, the board tried to make the guidance between the leasing guidance more consistent with the revenue recognition guidance. That makes a lot of sense. Well, thank you for all the information today, Hal, and thanks to our listeners. If you'd like more information about the Lisa Standard or any other FASB projects, please visit www.fasb.org.